So I'm going to give a talk about um, recontextualizing what we have learned in our space, in the product development space, and through the Lean Agile practice into um, public sector um, business operations, so people who do the work uh, in sort of various public sector organisations. My name is Chris McDermott. Um, as you can tell, I am from slightly further north than here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Jose for sort of giving me the Glasgow summer temperature room, <laughs> so I feel at home. That's really nice of him. Um, I am uh, a Lean and Agile coach. I am interested in uh, Lean and Agile, obviously, complexity, science, a little bit, social practice theory, which we'll talk a lot about today. Um, I am formerly the, I am the founder and former organiser of Lean Agile Scotland um, and uh, Lean Agile Glasgow, uh, former on both, it's too much effort to keep doing that for 10 plus years. Um, so, I'll crack on. You are going to need something to write with and something to write on. Uh, I've sc we've scattered some um, pens on the desk and there's blue cards, so not to confuse it with the green and the yellow and the red. I'm not going to ask you to do a lot, but that's, that's there for, um, for a little exercise to help illustrate something. So today's journey, today's what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've learned in the last 20 years in our industry, the last 20 plus years. Then we're going to have a little dive into what is practice. I'm going to discuss a theory that surrounds practice and helps us understand practice. I'm going to talk a little bit about a different context in which we can apply the practices that we've learned and then we'll talk that little bit at the end there about recontextualising um, lean and agile practice. I have, I have two goals two outcomes I'd like to seek from this, this presentation. First outcome is to inspire you to take the practices you have learned and apply them in a different context to help other people. We have done an awful lot of learning in our industry in the last 20 plus years and there's a lot of other areas, a lot of other areas of work which could really benefit from our help and what we have learned. So I want to inspire you to do that. And the second, I'd like to introduce you to a sort of new lens of thinking about work and thinking about how we do things uh, in a work environment. So, let's start with the 20 years. What have we learned in the last 20 years? So, let me tell you a story. Um, it's 2001. You have started, uh, you're going to start university. Uh, well, you are, if you're me, uh, and you're 40 something years old. Uh, and you start your new job, and you're given a tour of the office building in your new job. And you're told that th this is where the project managers sit, we sit here, uh, and this is where the business analysts sit, they, this is the business analyst team, we sit here, uh, and this is where the DBAs sit, and down there is where you sit with the developers, you're part of the development team. <laughs> and how the work works is the BAs, they go out to the customers, and they spend a few months doing this, and then they, they come back and they write this all up, in a requirements document. There's one, there's one over here. You can pick up if you like, but watch your back. It's a wee bit heavy. Um, <laughs> and then they pass it to you as developers, and then you do your magic stuff, and, and, and code, and product happens, and it's great. Uh, and to deploy the software, what you do is you, you run this script, and then you copy those files over there, and then you run another script, and I think there's two other scripts you need to run, and then you restart the server, and you've deployed your software, oh, but sometimes you have to restart the server a couple of times. It's one of these Oracle containers that doesn't work that well. Um, to test it, you need to log on, you need to put in this information here, and you navigate to this page, and you click some buttons, and, and that's, that's, you, that's how it works. Um, so imagine then, in this environment, you have, you've been there for five years, and in those five years, you have been involved in one project which made it live and into the hands of a user. And that was the first year we were there. And the four remaining years, you never deployed software into a production environment. That was my life in 2001 to 2006. I think a, a number of us who have been in the industry may have experienced something similar. Um, fast forward then to 2016, and it's different, it's changed. Um, you are busily coaching um, a couple of uh, agile teams, they've done some scrum in the past, but now you need to teach them about agile engineering practices, about flow, about, um, about various different uh, practices around continuous delivery and product development. And before you know it, this team has deployed more software into production in one day than you did in the first 10 years 
of your, your um, busy, hard-working uh, software developer life. So that's 15 years, that time frame. What changed? Well, there's quite a lot changed in that time. Um, we learned how to develop quality into products. We learned how to inspect and adapt products, plans, and processes. We learned how to visualize and make workflow, how to specify by examples, how to automate the last mile, how to validate our learning, how to get out the building, the options of value, uh, never commit unless you know why, that you, we learned how to predict performance and not play poker, use data to predict our performance. Um, and maybe we have created organisations that are worked in organisations that spark some joy. There's a lot changed in this, in this time pe period. Now, it's largely because of this um, wonderful piece of marketing. No, I didn't say design. Nothing says like a, a 90s website like the agilemanifesto.org. <laughs> it's pretty ugly, isn't it? Um, the most important line uh, in this document for me is the very first line. It says, we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. The key aspect of this, um, of that sentence, or the, the things that jump out to me, are those two words, doing and do. It doesn't say we are uncovering better ways of um, helping, uh, of developing software by thinking and helping others think it. It's about doing, it's about action, it's about actual practice and doing things that make a difference. Um, so this makes me think about two things that, the, while mindset is very important, it is that thing about action. It's about what the activities we do, what we do in, in, and we practice. Um, another thing makes me think about is learning and how we learn, how we learn new things and how we share uh, with others what we've learned by doing it and helping others do it. So, we've painted a, a bit of a, a picture of the last 20 years, what's changed, and it's been quite a dramatic change. It's been a, a really positive change. Certainly, I've experienced a really positive change in my work, and the, the people I work with have uh, experienced a very positive change in that time frame through all of that learning. Now, let me tell you another story. Um, it's 2000 and whenever. The story's pretty consistent for the last, at least the last 15 years. Um, imagine you are a civil servant, you are working in an agency of government and your job is maybe to, if you're in a land registry, your job may be to register a change in property so that someone who's spent the, the largest sum of money they'll ever spend in their life is securing the knowledge that the, the property or the land they now have is theirs. Or if you work for a benefits agency and your job is to ensure that an application for a benefit is processed so that people get the benefits they deserve to have a quality of life. Or you work in a pensions agency and your job there is to calculate a pension so that the last 40 years of a fellow civil servant's life um, pays, is paid correctly into the next 20 years or the remaining years of their life so that they can have a pension that makes them, gives them uh, a comfortable retirement. Um, the experience here isn't the best. Um, you, the, the work you work on uh, comes from a large queue of work, a ma large backlog of work. Some of the work that sits in this queue that you're working on may have been sitting there for years. What often happens is you'll pick up an application to process in this, in this context, and you'll look at it and it'll be too hard. You won't know what to do, so you'll put it back into the queue and it'll sit in that queue. Um, so you won't be able to complete it, so there's no self uh, uh, feeling of satisfaction in the completion of that work. Um, you'll also have to take your turn answering calls and emails from angry members of the public who haven't received, you know, their application hasn't been processed. So you have to, you know, uh, ensure them that it will be done, but because of these large backlogs and the, the, the pressures of work, you don't, uh, you don't know when. Um, You might have experienced some sort of digital transformation. I know there's been amazing work in the government um, through the, the, the work of the GDS. But what you might also feel uh, be a part of an agency who hasn't been had the funding to do that, and that the work you do, you'll be working on legacy systems, you'll have lots of workarounds to work with, you'll have real challenges. 
Um, then the first pandemic or the pandemic hits, you work from home, you're sitting in, at your kitchen table and the way in which you did get work done before where you could turn around and say to somebody, could you help me? They're not there anymore. You know, the, the social network that you had to help you get work done is eroding. It's getting harder and harder to get work done. So, um, but you, you plod on, you, you know the value in the work you do. You know how it helps people, members of the public, and the value it. So you, you struggle through these challenges. Um, so this is a, this, I've worked in uh, government for the last five years, six years, and I've seen this in a number of different contexts. Um, a number of people challenged, are really challenged in the work they do, and uh, they are high pressure. It can be a stressful environment. I often hear stories of people looking to leave and find other work, or um, taking taking long periods off sick because of the stress that they, they, they endure. Um, so the question then is, how can Lean Agile practice help here? How can what we've learned in our industry over these last 20 years um, help people in this, uh, in this context to do their work better and have a better engagement and a better life experience uh, and work? Um, quick spoiler alert, the answer to this question is not a set of practices do this, this and this, there is no recipe for this, uh, not one that I can, I can share anyway, that I know to share. Um, I don't believe there's a recipe for this, I think this is, uh, there's a lot of hard work to be done here to help uh, and apply these practices. So to answer this question, I want to ask another question, I want to answer another question. So this question is what is practice? What is a practice? So. As I said at the start, you'll need something to um, write on and something to write with. There are pens on the table, there are blue cards on the table, so um, not as to confuse us with the, the sort of feedback card. So if you want to grab one of them just, just now, or anything, if you, you know, if you, you prefer, you can write uh, on your phone with a notes app or something, not with a pen on your phone, I'm not suggesting that. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to take the pen and put it in your other hand, not your hand you predominantly write with. Yeah. And I simply want you to write your name. It's a wonderful, it's a great experience that, isn't it? It's quite, yeah, quite, it's feels a bit clumsy. Certainly it does for me, unless there's anybody amb ambidextrous, they just went, well, that's easy. Anyone? Yeah. Okay, we're done. Congratulations, you have just performed a social practice. You are all social practitioners, well done. Um, so what is then a social practice? So, a social practice is a routinized type of behavior which consists of several elements, interconnected to one another, forms of bodily activities, forms of mental activities, things, and their use, a background knowledge in the form of understanding, know-how, states of emotion, and motivational knowledge. That's quite a mouthful. So let's break that down into a simpler uh, definition. First thing to think, practices are reproducible, routinized, and shared. That's the basis to start with. Now, the, if you think about signing your name, if I ask you to sign your name again, with your opposite hand, it's a practice you can reproduce, you can do it again, yes? Um, you'd probably do it better if I didn't ask you to change your hand, but it's something you can reproduce. You can share it by showing others you did it. You can share it by showing others how to do it, yes? Um, you can share the, the output of you doing it. So it is this a social practice. Now, the lens, that well, that uh, paragraph there is quite great. It's detailed, descriptive. It's not very helpful. So what is really helpful, or what I've found really helpful, is the three elements model by Elizabeth Shove, um, which she describes in the book, The Dynamics of Social Practice. It says, um, practice is made up the integration of these three elements. First element is meaning. It's the purpose, the needs, the drivers, the motivations. It's the why you do the practice you do. Second is competence. It's the skills, it's the knowledge, it's your know-how, it's your procedural know-how, propositional know-how, participatory know-how, etc. It's how you know how to do it. And third, it's materials. It's things. Every practice requires some form of material to be completed. Think about here that what you're kind of doing here is you're skillfully manipulating material to meet the outcome. Yeah, you're using the competence of materials to get the meanings of that, that practice. So if you think of what you just did, 
The meaning was, well, meaning is partly an exercise to demonstrate social practice theory. The materials, well, there's a number of materials involved here, some the desk you're sitting at, you're all sitting at the desk, it makes it much easier. Um, the pen, the resource of the paper that you used, so there's lots of materials there. And the competence, as I said, is that you know how to write letters, you know how to spell your name, um, and so on. Um, so what there would change, just to, to, to illustrate a little bit more, what would, what would change of those three elements if I asked you to print your name, write it in block capitals? Meaning, material or competence, what would change? What would be different? Materials. So I can, there's, a, there's a potential change in meaning, so you print your name for a likely a different reason than you would write your name. Competence, you know, you need to know, you know, how to write block capital letters over, you know, um, smaller case letters. Um, if I asked you to type your name, what would change? Materials, the tools you use, etc. If I asked you to sign your name, likely meanings would change there. You sign your name to, to be sort of, um, have yourself recognised. Um, so, we'll just, let's take another example here from our industry then. TDD is a social practice. Yes? TDD, the meanings of TDD are quality, feedback, design, etc. The materials is your X unit framework, the code, the IDE, the terminal, the however you you could have manipulate the code in order to, to run a test. And the competence is, well, it's that you're you have the software development skills, you um, follow the red green refactor practice, or sorry, um, uh, process and you know how to design, mock, etc, etc. Just, I'm not going to ask you, we've got a lot to get through, not, not a lot of time. The, if you think about stand-up meetings, what's the material meanings and competencies there? If you think about retrospectives, what are the materials, meanings and competencies there that are required? Think about, think about any practice you do in day-to-day -day life and think about, you can then start to break them down and see them through this lens. This lens, lens is really helpful then when you start to think about how you might change a practice or how you might introduce a practice into a different context. Um, I'll quickly go through here. W practice can be seen in three of a life cycle, three stage life cycle, proto practice, i.e. The, the elements exist but they've not been integrated. A practice, we are integrating these elements and uh, ex practices, i.e. we no longer do this. This is not something we do. We have either forgotten to do it, how to do it, or it's something we do not need to do. So it doesn't exist, it's not being practiced. And efforts would have to be taken to then uh, reintroduce it as a practice. <coughs> Practices evolve, meanings change, materials change, uh, and the sort of slight change in shape at the end there indicates that what we often find is that competence is materialized. Yeah, the, 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 the way in which we do something becomes embodied in the thing we use to do it. So if you think about driving a car, uh, I recently got a car with um, adaptive cruise control, this is amazing. The competence of me sort of judging the distance between the car in front, I don't really have to do that any, anymore when I'm using adaptive cruise control. That, that, materi that competence has been materialised. I still know how to do this in case you ever find yourself <laughs> behind me on the road, I'm okay, I'm not. But there is like there's so much to, to practice theory and social practice theory. Um, there's, there's things we could talk about around the different kinds of material arrangements. We could talk about um, evolution further. We, we, there's loads of aspects of this. I'm not going to go into this. If you want to learn more, I would suggest reading Strove's book, Dynamics of Social Practice. Um, but what I want to then do is I want to show you how this helps. How can this help us um, understand the work uh, we do and how we can maybe change uh, and adapt practice to new contexts. So if you think about this, this picture here uh, depicts the practices that uh, Kent Beck described in Extreme Programming Explained. And what I want to try and show here is the relationships that exist between these practices. It's not just a relationship of one follows the other or a relationship of need or a relationship of outputs uh, that are, are materials that are created, but there are also relationships that exist in the, the competencies required in order to do the practice. There's relationships that exist in the, the meanings of the practice and um, the materials required. 
So there's lots of different ways in which you can see this. We could spend a long time dissecting this slide and looking at all of the, the different uh, aspects as well. But if you think about um, the shared competence required for like, the planning game or on-site customer, the kind of negotiation and the skills you have to have in order to do that and work in that, that kind of way. What I want to show you a bit more depth around is the idea of sharing practice. So the first thing we need to do is identify a practice, give it a name, say this is what we do, this is the practice we do. Then we need to go through the process of decontextualising it. How can this practice sit on its own, out with the context in which we find it? How can we disentangle it from the context that, that we find it in so that we have it? And then we can store it, we can save it, we can write it down, we can remember it in order for reproduction in a different context. And then we have to think about how we recontextualise this practice. How do we take the practice we've used in one context and move it and implant it into a different context? Uh, Stephen Chemist, practice uh, theorist, has a lovely phrase called, um, uh, get a lovely kind of uh, metaphor around mixing in practice. How do you stir in and mix in a practice into a new context? And what you, what you have to think about here is, where is the shared meaning? Where is the shared competence? Where is the shared materials? Where are the things that allow this practice to sit comfortably in this new context? Um, if you look quickly, I've kind of tried to draft a, 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 a set of practices, a network of practices that might make the introduction of TDD slightly difficult here. We could look that maybe the testing is done by testers and they do test scripting and test execution and coding is done by developers and they don't do testing. That's the, the primary role is in coding. So actually mixing in TDD into this environment is a complicated, a complex activity to do. So we think about those kinds of things. So moving on quickly, context. The context we're going to explore is well, this is the context we're probably familiar with. This is how work, as we imagine it, is worked in the world of, world of product development. Somebody has an idea that's prioritised, there's some discovery done, some design work, development done, testing work, blah, 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 blah. The software is delivered. If we think about how work is done in the context I gave you earlier on about the public sector business operations, there is a life event, something happens to someone, they then fill in a form, the form is rooted and then it's processed. So these are entirely different contexts. Some things that might differ for us to think about, um, the variation of the task. If you think of the variation of task in product development, it might be quite high. You're actually wanting to do something different every time you do some software development or product development. If you do the same thing, you're kind of wasting your time. Yeah, you want to do something new and create something new. In the business operations process, it's quite low. You're actually repeating the same process. Um, you're, the, the variation is, lo is much lower in the, the work you have to do. Frequency of demand in software, it could be quite low and, and maybe do what t a software team could do, maybe 10 stories a week, something like that, whereas there's hundreds of applications that are processed in the business operations space. Autonomy over task, high focus and improvement, and so on. There is a various different ways in which we could look at this context to see how it differs. Um, and I'm rushing because I know I've only about five or 10 minutes left. So recontextualizing practice. Now I want to tell you a couple of stories. It first is a story about um, land registration in Scotland and a problem where um, there was a huge bottleneck to, to resolve in the work. It, the, the idea when you register land, you have to draw a plan that says here on this map is the boundaries of your property. This is where you, this is land you now own and this has to be processed and, and work has to be done to do that. Now, the environment this was done in, um, the properties were going through a process called first registration, i.e. this is their first entry onto a digital land register. They had been registered on what was called the, the Register of Seizing, which is the oldest land register, uh, active land register in the world. Um, but it's basically ink on parchment, right? It is you own from the tree to the, to the road by such and such as farm. This has to, the lot of work has to be done to legally um, register this land. So in order to do this, there's two, two main steps. A lawyer will have to prove the ownership. They'll have to say, hey, we, we need proof of this land in order for it to be sold. A map has to be drawn to do that. And then it has to be registered when it is changed. So the selling lawyer does a proof of ownership. The buying lawyer registers the change. In both of these occasions, the map is a very important, very important thing to do. What we found in Registers of Scotland was that the maps were being drawn up to eight times huge amounts of rework being done. 
So someone said, let's use supply some lean principle and reduce this waste and we'll reuse this map. In order to do that, we had to work this out. It wasn't as straightforward as they just reuse it. There was a lot of underlying process and practice that had to change. So I was given the opportunity to work with a, a small group of volunteers to come up with a way of doing this. What we had to put out, the opportunity was given um, was a new context for me. I didn't understand this context, so I had to work with this team in order to help them work out how to apply the thinking, the practice from our industry into this new space. So we came up with this set of practices that we, we used in order to um, work out and design a new way of doing this mapping and fixing this mapping problem. What we found here, this was quite an easy job to do, to be honest. There was no incumbent practice. There was nothing here to change. It was a new ground in which we could introduce new practice. People came fresh. They had detached themselves from their old roles. They were now in new roles and we could introduce new practice in order for them to design and develop a new way. So the meanings were shared, there was fresh ideas, was, um, we had to solve the problems here and a shared vision was, was, was created. So this new introduction of this new practice was quite straightforward. What we did do is we designed a, pro a, a new practice into the process of proving ownership of the maps of the land. Uh, where the map was saved, this new practice was introduced. The practitioners in this space who did the proving of the ownership bit, they adapted this, adopted this practice quite simply. There was a very little um, uh, sort of friction in the adoption of this practice because it was coherent with other practices they did. They, uh, they already drew the map, so let's save the map in a way that it can be reused. Then we had the, pra the practice of reusing the map, right? So. Four weeks later, the, the application comes in to change the land register. Someone has done the proving of the ownership bit. We have a map, now we want to reuse the map. This was incredibly difficult to do because there was a lack of trust. The meanings, the underlying meaning for the people who processed this work was around the, the personal responsibility for the quality of their work. So if they reused work that someone else did and it was wrong, then they were personally responsible for that, that, that piece of work um, being rejected. The competencies there, the materials were there, the meanings did not, the meanings rubbed against, so that practice was not adopted. So what did we learn there? We learned a number of things in this, this short um, experimental phase around visualisation, limiting WIP, etc. Um, using um, sort of practices from uh, from Lean UX. So there's a number of different things in there. I have two minutes, I better hurry up. Um, what we then did as part two of this experiment was we designed teams who would be responsible for both aspects of this process, the proving and, and the registering of the, new, of the land when the, the property had changed. We took the team who had been working with the experimental practices and we introduced them, we gave them a broader set of people to work with who could then help them do the whole process. So the practices of experimentation and experiment design and things like that sat comfortably with these new practices that they had to do in order to register land. They had been using these practices, they were practices that were incumbent in their work already, so that it was easy to then establish in that space. Um, we looked around the, the, the key purpose that we tried to change here was away from this, the individual responsibility into team responsibility and look at workflow. We tried to adjust the meanings and the, the, the responsibilities of work. Um, we then scaled this by introducing lots of number of different teams who would do the processing list. So we, d we removed all this waste from the process and we, we, all, we then introduced shared and boundary practice between leadership who would run their own retrospectives and the teams who would do the processing, they would run their own retrospectives and in the middle we had retrospectives that would run and it would help them connect these teams so we had this steady flow of learning and of change that would happen across these different teams um, and, uh, and the different sort of boundary areas that are there. What do we learn here? Focus on flow. We developed cross-functional teams in this space, so we adopted those practices and that way of working uh, into this context. Um, very quickly, we had another scenario with different teams where we introduced retrospectives. 
failed miserably. There was nothing for the retrospectives to hook onto, nothing for them to be able to um, use the outputs of retrospectives in order to um, link in with other things they did. There was a stop, a, a, a resistance there. I will finish by saying um, that for me, we, the, the change exists in the change of practice. Um, Stephen Chemist again would say, we only know that change has taken hold when we can see a sustained change in practice. We can see what people do differently. So examining work through the lens of practice and thinking about practices and those elements of practice help us identify how practice can sit, how practice can move uh, in different environments, but it also allows us to recognise the, the mindsets, the way we think about, it, work, about work through meanings, and the, the sort of tools and the competencies that are required in order for people to, to do the work and practice. And I have run over shortly. Um, last thing, I'll run a short workshop tomorrow um, introducing an approach called change mapping um, that uses practice theory and uh, integrates with Wardley maps to create visualisations of different contexts in which people work uh, in order to help you see the practices you use and help you understand where they sit in a maturity and how you want to change them. That's me. Thank you. <laughs>